so this is what we would have gone over today, either in, on Wednesday at two o'clock in class, or if you're watching this for the Tuesday, Thursday class, this is what we would have gone over Thursday morning at eight. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna go and lecture through chapter seven. You have the PowerPoints, they are in VCamp. You can pull them up and follow along, take notes, or just listen however you choose to do it um, for that information. So I'm just gonna kind of plow through and see how far we get. So hopefully we'll get pretty far. So today what we're doing is we're talking about memory, which is one of my favorite things to talk about. I really like our chapter on memory. I think it's because I think memory is so interesting and relatable. We all know someone who, or have experienced a time where we've wished we had maybe a better memory or someone who maybe has struggled with, with memory issues. So the first thing we want to do is we want to define memory. Memory is defined as the, as a set of procedures that are used to first encode, store, and then retrieve information over different periods of time. And memory really breaks down into those three processes, encoding, storing, and retrieving. So that's where we're gonna focus when we talk about how memory works. So we begin with encoding. Now, encoding is where we're taking information in and we're hopefully doing something with it. We're either gonna remember it and learn it and store it, <coughs> or we don't pay attention to it, and it goes away. So when we encode information, it's automatic processing, um, as well as at effort for, effortful processing. So many things comes into our memory and we're automatically gonna remember them. We don't have to try to remember them, they just get stuck in our memory. Other times we have to put in um, work to remember what we wanna remember. So it's effortful, we have to put in an effort for it. So when we encode information, we're encoding it acoustically, which means it comes into our, through sound, which you may or may not be able to hear. It's currently thunder sleeting in Newport, so um, I'm hearing thunder. Um, we also encode information visually. So again, we take in information um, through our eyes, the visual system, and we encode information semantically, which means we encode information for meaning. Um, so information comes in and there's a meaning to it uh, that I experience and for that reason I remember it. So encoding, automatic, or, and, takes effort, we can do it acoustically, visually, or semantically. Now, with storage, our second process of memory, um, we store, we have two main areas of storage. We have what we call short-term memory or short-term storage, STM for short, um, and there's two types of short-term um, storage that we have. The first is our sensory memory, which is everything we see, we hear, we experience sensorially. So we can take in a ton of information into our sensory memory. And we only hold it for maybe two seconds and then it's gone. We, if we don't pay attention to it, we don't recall it. So it's um, one of those things we take in and we experience, but we don't really pay attention to. If we pay attention to our sensory memory, then that memory goes to our short-term memory, or STM. Our short-term memory is where we hold basically seven pieces of information, plus or minus two. That's called the magic number seven. It was found by a man named George Miller, and he wrote an article called the magic number seven, plus or minus two, and we found that the best amount of information we can hold in our short-term memory is five to nine pieces of information, five to nine, which is seven plus or minus two. So seven pieces of information, for example, a phone number, uh, which is exactly seven numbers. Uh, we're able to hold for a couple of seconds while we say it over and over again in our heads until we can find something to write it down on. So we can hold these seven pieces of information, plus or minus two, for up to between 15 to 18 seconds, approximately. After that point, we forget it, or it transfers into our long-term memory. So memory consolidation, <coughs> excuse me, is what happens when we take our short-term memory and we move it into long-term memory. So we consolidate it. 
Um, and our long-term memory, or LTM, is our long-term storage um, of memory. So it's what we want to hopefully remember forever and ever. Ideally, once something is put into long-term memory, it's there forever. The problem is sometimes, like forgetting where you put your keys, you also forget where you store things in your head. Um, and so we can forget where we have placed things in our memory, and that's we'll talk about forgetting, and that's where that comes in. The third and final process of memory is retrieval. Once we've placed it in an LTM in long-term storage, we have to be able to retrieve it. We have to get able to get it back. And that's where information is recovered from long-term memory so we can use it. So I want to hold up um, on this iPad. You can't really see it because it's backwards. I realize that. But you see we have colored words and the colored words themselves are different colors. This is called the Stroop test. And it is a test of sensory memory. So what you do is instead of you have to read the word, not the color. So for example, you see there we have yellow, but it's written in green type. So you can't say green, you have to say yellow. Um, and black is written in yellow. So you say yellow, black, purple, orange, blue, green. Um, instead of green, yellow, red, black, green, blue um with that so our what happens is our right brain tries to say the color word the color it is but our left brain insists on reading the word not the color and so we experience this the 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 difference between the two of that and that's one of our examples of how memory works um particularly our sensorial memory now, there is one other type of memory we need to briefly talk about, and it's called working memory. It is a subcomponent of short-term memory. Sometimes short-term memory is also called working memory. Um, and it is an active system in short-term memory. What it does is it contains three parts. It has a phonological loop, which deals with our auditory processing of what we hear. So sometimes we hear something and we say it over and over again. Um, we have a visio spatial ske uh, scre sketch pad, which allows us to kind of see things um, drawn or in diagram form and remember it that way. And then we have something called a central executive, which kind of pulls everything together for us. Um, and that is kind of an, an over, um, oversight type, uh, type, type area. So we've talked about short-term memory. We talked about George Miller. We talked about our magic number seven plus or minus two. And in short-term memory, we hold it for 15 to 18 seconds before we forget it. Another aspect of short-term memory is something called chunking. And what chunking is, is we can group things together in, in um, like acronyms and we can learn the acronym and that's take instead of one letter standing for um, one chunk so we have like three letters that can now be one chunk of information instead of just one letter being one chunk of information so you can learn more uh, to hold in short-term memory now the reason we first started studying memory was actually with a man named herman Ebbinghaus, who's pretty amazing. And Ebbinghaus was in Germany um, at the same time that psychology is just taking place and really coming to a head in 1879. And he decides that, in, uh, probably in the 1880s, he decides he wants to really study um, memory. But at this time, Wilhelm Wundt, our founder of psychology, has said, you know what, I don't think you can study memory. Um, I don't see how one could study that scientifically. And what happened is, uh, what's his name? Ebbinghaus, sorry, I'm gonna adjust my camera here. Ebbinghaus said, you know what, Vund, you're wrong. I think you can study memory um, and do so scientifically, and I'm gonna show you how to do that. And so he did. He didn't have a job. He'd finished graduate school, and so he was trying to get a job, and he decided, you know what, I'm gonna do these experiments on my own in the hopes that at the end of this, I can publish a book or write it up, and maybe some university will hire me. And in fact, that's what happened. So he began studying memory. And he used himself as his own subject. So here's what he did is he created lists of what he called nonsense syllables. Basically, these were three letter 
um, combi a combination of three letters together that did not have a meaning for him in, in German. And he made lists and lists and lists. And what he did is he memorized them. He learned them. He went over them over and over again. And then he would try to recall them and see how many he could remember out of that. And so that was kind of our very first memory studies. So he would learn one list, recall it, and then perhaps he would learn a new list and then recall it and then try to recall the first list and see if he could remember that. And in doing that, he began studying memory. And what he did is he began to chart uh, his progress for this. And what he discovered is there's something called the memory curve. And the memory curve ends up having what we call our two, um, two effects. Basically, there's a primacy effect, which says that we tend to remember those things we learned first in a list. So if you've ever gone to Walmart, we tend to remember, like, you, know, you have a list of 12 things, so we tend to remember the first three things on that list quite easily. Um, that's the primacy effect. And then he talked, discovered something called the recency effect, meaning that we tend to remember the last three things on the Walmart list, the most recent things we put on the list. However, it's those items in the middle of the list we don't tend to remember quite as well. Um, so that's this idea of the memory curve. Now with this, this applies to how you study. So if you think about it, oftentimes you study um, what you study first off uh, for a test, uh, the primacy, and what you study last for the test, the recency, you remember best. But that stuff in the middle, we tend to forget. So the way to combat that and adjust for that is to study things out of order. So for this next test, it will cover chapters five, six, seven, and eight. So what you want to do is, yes, study chapter 5, 6, 7, 8, and study them in order. But then you want to study chapter 6 and 7, and then 5, and then, or then 8, and then 5. And then you want to mix it up again and study chapter 7 first and chapter 6 last. Um, and, and do that so that in studying them out of order that way, you're more likely to um, not experience the memory curve where you're going to forget the information in the middle. So this brings us to long-term memory. And, <coughs> excuse me, for long-term memory, we know that some information is encoded automatically. Um, we've all had an experience that something has happened to us. Uh, sometimes it's real, something really good. Usually it's something associated with a strong emotion. So it could be something really good, the best day of our life, or the best thing that's happened to us. Or it's something um, more tragic, something really sad or surprising or upsetting has happened, and we tend to remember that. So that is information that is stored in our long-term memory, and it just happened. We did not purposely set out to remember either one of those situations. It just occurs. However, that's not the what usually happens. Usually we have to um, encode that information that we're learning. And to encode it, we have to be effort. We have to, do you, to encode things, we need two things. First, we need effort. And second, we need rehearsal, meaning that we have to practice over and over again. So one of the best ways to study notes, for example, for, for for psychology, if you're studying, is to study as we go along. So after every class, review your notes for that day. Do the Hawks assignments during the time that we're talking about that chapter. Don't wait and leave them all to the end. So after we've talked about chapter five, do the chapter five Hawks. Um, do chapter six Hawks while we're talking about chapter six, so on and so forth. Doing it as we go along allows for more time to have um, more rehearsal, more practice. And the more we do that and the more effort we put into it, the easier it is to recall it. So we have two main types of long-term memory. The first main type of long-term memory is called explicit memory. We also call this declarative memory. It's the same thing. Um, it means the same thing. So explicit memory are those memories we consciously try to recall. For example, take a minute, what was the name of your first grade teacher? So you take a minute and you kind of consciously recall their name or their face and bring it to mind. 
it's not readily apparent, readily in your brain, but once you think about it, you can usually come up with something. And then you could tell me about it. You could tell me their name or what they look like. With the explicit memory, we have two subsystems. We have episodic memory and semantic memory. Episodic memory are those memories that we have personally experienced. So those are your personal memories of high school graduation. Those are episodic memory. We also have semantic memory. Those have to do with language and knowledge about language. So for example, um, knowing who the first president of the United States is or who founded psychology, those are examples of semantic memory. Our second subsystem is called implicit memory. And it is also called non-declarative memory. These are memories that are not a part of our consciousness. So we have two subsystems of non-declarative or implicit memories, and they are procedural memory and classical conditioning. So procedural memory is our how to do things, how to tie a shoe, how to ride a bike, how to drive a car, how to write your name. Those are all um, procedural things. And we learn those and they're committed to memory. Um, but at the, the, the way we know that they're procedural memories is they're really hard to verbally describe. Um, it takes effort and thought and it doesn't come naturally to us. Um, and then, of course, when we learn for classical conditioning, when we associate that neutral stimulus becomes a conditioned stimulus, that's a learning. Um, and so that also is implicit memory. It's something that often happens without us being aware of it. So there are a number of areas of the brain that are involved in memory. Um, the first is, and people have been looking for where memory is stored in the brain for years and years and years. And one of the first people really to do that is a man named Carl Lashley. And he thought that within our brain, there should be a specific area of the brain associated with specific memories. Um, and he called that specific area of the brain and that where a specific memory was located, an ingram. It turns out that's not how memory works. It turns out that we have, memory is more diffuse all over the brain. Um, so there are a number of areas of the brain that are responsible for memory and different types of memory. So the amygdala, which is associated with emotions, um, a lot of times is associated with our strong emotional memories. Um, the hippocampus uh, is tied with memory and learning. The cerebellum and the prefrontal cortex are also part of memory and have and play a role in that. So amygdala, hippocampus, cerebellum, and prefrontal and the frontal cortex. So, for example, the frontal lobe, uh, frontal cortex deals with attention and working memory. Um, the cerebellum deals with our motor skills and our coordination and that type of memory. Now, we all experience something called flashbulb memories. Now, flashbulb memories are pretty cool. And what they are, they are memories that are detailed, they are vivid memories of surprising and emotion-provoking events. So, for example, um, my mom, who is in her 70s, has a memory of when John F. Kennedy was president and when he was assassinated. She was in, um, I think, fifth grade at that time. And she remembers learning that the president had been assassinated. She has a flashbulb memory of that. She can tell you where she was, what she was doing, what was happening that day. Um, many people have, uh, your parents, for example, um, anyone older, then that, uh, and me, and many other people have flashbulb memories of 9-11, um, of what they were doing and how they learned about it and where they were during the attack. Um, for that, for you, you may have a, a flashbulb memory of when you learned that Kobe, Bar uh, let me try that again, when Kobe Bryant died in that helicopter crash. Those are flashbulb memories. They tend to be very strongly associated with strong emotions. Now, uh, we also have them for, for example, maybe graduation, maybe um, the birth of a, a, of a child, um, proposals, you know, things like that. 
Now, we've talked about what happens when memory goes, when everything's going right with memory. But what happens when things go wrong in memories? So let's take a look at our problems with memories. And we're gonna begin with amnesia, which is, of course, uh, the loss of long-term memory that occurs as a result of disease physical trauma, or psychological trauma. And we have two types of amnesia that we're going to talk about. There's anterior grade amnesia and retrograde amnesia. Now, anterior grade amnesia is commonly caused by brain trauma, like a blow to a head, concussion, something like that. And it's where you cannot remember new information. So say you get a concussion um, on, the, on the soccer field. So what happens is you may recall um, the start of the game, but after the, you've been hit, after the blow to the head, if you have um, amnesia, you're not gonna remember what happened after that. So new information is not, is not stored. Um, the hippocampus is usually affected and there's an inability to transfer information from short-term to long-term memory that and an inability to consolidate new memories. So also you may be unable to form new semantic or episodic memories, um, but you can usually do new procedural memories. Sorry, do you hear my cat meowing? He wants in the room, so I'll be right back. The next type of amnesia is retrograde amnesia. And this is, it occurs, a loss of memories that happened before the traumatic event happened, whether it was a concussion or a psychological trauma or something. Um, so they can remember some um, or all of past events, um, but they have difficulty rem remembering episodic memories. So retrograde is, um, you can't remember past events, Anterior grade is you can't remember new events. So what we do with memories is we construct them. We can construct them from is the formation of new memories. And um, that's when we make new memories, we construct them. And then we have reconstruction is when we bring up old memories. You may have noticed that there are times when you can Recall uh, an event with a sibling or a cousin or a friend or something that happened a long time ago, and you may both remember it a little differently than what happened. Um, and that is that kind of reconstruction of memories. When you talk about it, you, you come at it from different points of view. <coughs> so how, excuse me, do we then, um, let's talk about recall, retrieving information. So we have recall, recognition, and tip of the tongue phenomenon. Let me find where that is in the textbook. And we will talk about these. Maybe they're not in the textbook. I thought they were. Go back a little bit. Yes, here we go. So recall is what we most often think about when we talk about memory retrieving. So it means I can access the information without cues, meaning that I can ask you, what is your phone number? And you can just recite it to me. You don't have to look it up. That's recall. Recognition is when you can't recall it right away, but you know if you see it, you'll remember it. So a lot of times on tests, if you know it's going to be multiple choice, it might be something that you're looking for recognition as opposed to recall. And then we have something called tip of the tongue phenomenon. What this is, is you've ever had that moment where somebody asks you a question and you know you know the answer and it's on the tip of your tongue, but you can't remember what it is. Isn't that frustrating? That is tip of the tongue phenomenon um, with that and with regards to that. We then also have retrieval cue. Sometimes we can't remember something and somebody says, oh, but it, like for example, if I said, who founded psychology? And you're like, oh, I remember some old white guy with a beard, um, I think. And I said, well, his name started with a W. And you'd be like, oh yeah, Vunt. 
um, that would be a retrieval cue. So kind of like if I see the W, if I hear the W, I'll remember the name. That's a, that's a cue. Um, and then we have what are called state-dependent memories, meaning that sometimes our, the, hmm, the way we're feeling, uh, the way we're thinking can affect how we learn things. We all know that if we're in a calm state, and we're studying, we're more likely to be able to remember the information and recall it and at that time if we're in that, get back into that stay and calm state when we need to recall it than if we're upset. It can be really hard to learn new information when you're upset um, and you're less likely to remember it. So our state, our feelings of that time have are important when we're trying to learn and um, recall information. Um, we can have something called feeling of knowing experience. Now, let me just go ahead and say that these uh, definitions are on your terms and definitions pages. If they're not on the terms and definition pages, they are in your PowerPoint. Okay. So feeling of knowing experience is where subjects are able to correctly gauge the probability that they will recognize the correct answer to a question that they are unable to answer through recall. And then we have something called eidetic imagery, and that's someone who has basically a photographic memory. So they may see the page of a textbook and be able to recall everything on that textbook, but the important part of eidetic imagery is that even though they can bring it back up really quickly and, and come up with the correct answer, they may not understand what they're reading or what they're talking about. So sometimes we can have errors in memory. And we're gonna talk about um, some specific examples of memory errors. The first <coughs> is called transience. And this is where you cannot recall details, um, maybe of a book that you read many, time, many years ago. So what happens is storage decays, um, means that uh, unused information tends to fade with the passage of time. Absent-mindedness, this is where you can't remember why you walked into a room. And so you have to turn around and go back. Um, so in some cases, <coughs> excuse me. So in ca some cases, um, these lapses in memories are caused by breaks in attention on our focus um, or because we're thinking about something else. So we get distracted and it's, it's gone. Sometimes we have trouble remembering information because of blocking. This is where the information is on the tip of our tongue, but we cannot be recalled. So we're unable to access the information where it's stored in our brains. We have misattribution. This is where we confuse our sources of information. This happens when we maybe have a false memory. Um, about the source of the information, like you think it came from this source, but it turns out you were wrong. Oh, I saw that on YouTube. No, no, it was on Twitter. Or no, no, that was in class. And then we have bias. And this is the feeling that our worldview distorts our memory of past events. So there are different types of bias. You can have stereotypical bias, uh, which involves racial and gender biases. You can have egocentric bias, which is when we enhance our memories of the past. And you can have hindsight bias, which is what happens when we think um, an outcome was inevitable after the fact. And then our last example of memory error is persistence. And this is where we keep remembering something to the point where we can't forget it and we want to forget it, um, but it keeps popping up. So another thing we might consider is why we forget. And one of the reasons we forget is simply due to decay. It's interference. And this is decay over time. So we forget due to just passage of time. We can't remember. It's been a long time since we experienced something or did that. So we've forgotten it happened. We can experience two other types of interference. One is called retroactive interference, which is where new information interferes with old information. So for example, say you are, say in high school you learned French. I did, I took high school French. Um, 
and then say when I got to college, I decided um, my college didn't offer French, so I was going to take um, Russian. So when my new Russian that I'm learning interferes with me from recalling my high school French, that is retroactive interference. The new information interferes with the old. Proactive interference is the opposite of that. That's when old information um, interferes with new. So in that example, it'd be I'd be trying to recall my new Russian that I've learned, but instead all I can think of is French. Um, that would be proactive interference. Now there are different things you can do to learn, help you learn and recall information. One of those things is called rehearsal. Um, and elaborative rehearsal. And what we mean by that is you not only go over the information over and over again, you do so and relate it to what you're learning on numerous deep levels. You learn so at a deeper level of understanding than merely surface learning. Well, you can do the chunking that we talked about. You can do mnemonic devices. So for example, um, in neuroscience, you have to learn uh, the 12 cranial nerves. And one of the ways to do that is to take the first letter of each word, and um, when you take the first letter of each word, you make a, a sentence out of that, out of using those first letters. And the sentence is, on old Olympic towering tops of Finn and German, vault, skip, and hop. And I know that the O for on stands for um, ophthalmic, and then we have ocular motor, towering, that would be trocular, tops, trigeminal, um, a fin would be facial, um, and a is auditory, a fin and, uh, and auditory, German is a glossopharyngeal, um, vault is vagus, skip is spinal accessory, um, vault skip uh, abducin, abducens and uh, hop is hypoglossial. So that allows me to recall the 12 cranial nerves. I couldn't deal without that, that mnemonic. That's just, I learned that in college and I still remember it today. It helps that I have to go over it every, every fall semester in neuroscience, but that's a mnemonic. So we can use mnemonic devices like that to help us recall information. We can do expressive writing where, for example, for this chapter, if you wanted to do expressive writing, you would write out um, everything you know about memory. You would talk about um, the three, how we store memory, how we encode memory, how we process, retrieve memory. You would talk about ebbing house and the memory curve. You would talk about short-term memory, working memory, long-term memory, the different types of long-term memory. Um, and uh, so on and so forth. So as you go through each of those things, you would write about it and maybe relate it back to your life. And in doing so, it will help you remember it. Um, and the third thing is simply saying things out loud helps us remember things too. So simply times just talking about it and saying it out loud can help us remember. So one of the last slides in the PowerPoint is how to study effectively, which is appropriate, right? So first thing is to use elaborative rehearsal. Second is to apply the self-reference effect, meaning that if you can relate it back to your life, it becomes more meaningful and it's easier to recall when it relates back to you personally. Um, third is write your notes in your own words. So once you've taken notes or you've looked at the PowerPoint, rewrite that in your own words. Write definitions from the text and then put those definitions in your own words. Um, relate the material to something you've already learned. Uh, re think about how you can apply the concepts to your own life. Don't forget the forgetting curve. Remember, don't just concentrate on the things in the middle, the first things you learned and the last thing you learned. Don't forget about that stuff in the middle. Put that as the first thing you learned and that is the last thing you learned. Rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. How do you learn lines for play? You rehearse, rehearse, you rehearse, right? Um, be aware of interference. Know that that's gonna happen. Keep moving. When you get stuck, get up, walk around. I used to pace when I would try and, when I would study, get up and I would move. I would sit for a while and then I'd get up and I'd move. And I would talk out loud and um, do all sorts of things. Get enough sleep. Sleep, sleep, sleep. 
um, and use the mnemonic devices. Make up your own uh, for remembering uh, things like that. Don't use the ones that you have. All right, that is a very quick synopsis of chapter seven. So um, this is covering Wednesday and Thursday. And I very much hope to see you next week on Tuesday when we will start chapter eight, Monday and Tuesday when we will do chapter eight. We're supposed to have exams coming up starting Thursday and Monday. I think it'll probably be um, Monday and Tuesday of the following week. So um, keep that in mind. Be working on your hawks. Um, keep up with that. Hopefully you will have electricity for the next couple of days. I hope we do. Um, and have internet. Stay warm. Stay safe. And I hope to see you next week. Email me if you have questions about anything, okay? Bye.